I'll start. This is lesson 360. Peace be to me, the Holy Son of God. Peace to my brother who is one with me. Let all the world be blessed with peace through us. Father, it is your peace that I would give, receiving it of you. I am your son, forever just as you created me. For the great rays remain forever still and undisturbed within me. I would reach to them in silence and in certainty, for nowhere else can certainty be found. Peace be to me, and peace to all the world. In holiness were we created, and in holiness do we remain. Your Son is like to you in perfect sinlessness, and with this thought we gladly say Amen. <laughs> All right, so we're starting from 117. Special principles of miracle workers. Number one, the miracle abolishes the need for lower order concerns since it is an illogical or out of pattern time interval by definition. The ordinary considerations of time and space do not apply. I do not regard time as you and Bill do, and Kolb's space problem is not mine. When you perform a miracle, I will arrange both time and space to adjust to it. Two, clear distinction between what has been created and what is being created is essential. All forms of correction or healing rest on this fundamental correction in level perception. Three, another way of stating two is never confuse right-mindedness with wrong-mindedness. <clears throat> Responding to any form of miscreation with anything except a desire to heal or a miracle is an expression of this confusion. The miracle is always a denial of this error and an affirmation of the truth. Only right-mindedness can create in a way that has any real effect. Pragmatically, what has no real effect has no real existence. Its real effect then is emptiness. Being without substantial content it lends itself to projection. <laughs> See, what I like about that is he's really consistent in seeing or in trying to tell, get us to realize that since the world is an illusion, the effects in the illusion are not real. So the mistake has no real effect. You know, we may think it does. It, it, it's like sort of what Brendan was talking about. You know, the idea that we don't hear is, is really meaningless because when we do hear, we hear. And it, only in the illusion are we not hearing. So not hearing is actually an illusion because we're always in communication with God and with everyone else. So, you know, anything that's not that isn't real anyway. But it, 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 that's what I was trying to say. So our concern with the illusion, you know, has been ha, has been almost total until we have an experience of reality. Then we go back and forth, but we're, we still have concern about the illusion affecting the reality. And that's what he's saying is level confusion. Level, you know, you, you're whole and perfect because God created you. And nothing in the illusion can change that even our thoughts to the effect that it's not true can't change that. And mistaken thoughts about it can't change it. 
So, you know, we're whole and perfect as God created. Get used to it. Because <laughs> it's going to be true. Go ahead. The other cool thing about it is too, because he's always trying to see that our errors, like you say, like our errors had no effect. And right. that is what brings us peace. Like, you know, when we read the miracle principles, he's saying the miracle shows us we dream a dream whose contents are not true. So it's, so that's going back to that really anything here really has no real effect. And that is really our whole problem and the thought of fear and guilt that we did change, we did <laughs> think something that had some real effect. And so when that's seen through, you can't, you know, we can but laugh. We're home then. We remember right. that what we thought we did really had no effect. We remember what happened never happened. <laughs> Pragmatically, what has no real effect? has no real existence its real effect then is emptiness being without substantial content it lends itself to projection that's what and that's the ultimate in the tiny mad idea which we remember not to laugh we thought it had an effect and the effect was the entire world of space and time none of which is true even in from the minutest particle of it to the totality of it none of it is true so none of it had any true effect, no real effect at all. The level adjustment power of the miracle creates the right perception for healing. Until this has occurred, healing cannot be understood. Forgiveness is an empty gesture unless it entails correction. Without this, it is essentially judgmental rather than healing. Miraculous forgiveness is only correction. It has no element of judgment at all. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do, in no way evaluates what they do. It is strictly limited to an appeal to God to heal their minds. This, there is no reference to the outcome of their misthought. That does not matter because their misthought doesn't exist, it only causes suffering, and that's what we're trying to avoid. Suffering and a mistake of our identity. The biblical injunction, be of one mind, is the statement for revelation readiness. My own injunction, do this in, do this in remembrance of me, is the request for cooperation in miracle working. It should be noted that the two statements are not in the same order of reality because the latter involves a time awareness since memory, memory implies recalling the past in the present. Time is under my direction, but timelessness belongs to God alone. In time, we exist for and with each other. In timelessness, we coexist with God. And that is sort of an important thing to understand as far as the entire teaching of the Course and what we've been talking about. Be as thou wast, be as thou wast want to be, see as thou wast want to see. Project is a noun to extend forward or out. Project, a noun, a plan for the mind. World, a natural grand divide, grand division. Note the original word. There is one more point which must be perfectly clear before any residual fear, which may still be associated with miracles, becomes entirely groundless. Yeah. Just hearing that when we read world, me, meaning grand division again you know how he uses terms differently there is no world there is no grand division exactly it's like an entirely different way of hearing it and the idea of world i know and that's you know that's why i think it's important that people sort of they get reminded to use or at least within this 
the context of the course, they get reminded that the way Jesus uses words is not traditional. Um, so when he says there is no world, what he's saying is there is no grand division. There's nothing to divide us. There's nothing dividing us from, from our reality as God created us and where we are. This is good too. There is one more point which must be perfectly clear before any residual fear, which may be still associated with miracles, becomes entirely groundless. The crucifixion did not establish the atonement. The resurrection did. This is a point which many very sincere Christians have misunderstood. Nobody who was free of the scarcity prince, scarcity fallacy could possibly have made this mistake. If the crucifixion is seen from an upside down point of view, it certainly does appear as if God permitted and even encouraged one of his sons to suffer because he was good. Many very devoted ministers preach this every day. This particularly unfortunate interpretation, which actually arose out of the combined misprojection of a large number of my own would-be followers, has led many people to be bitterly afraid of God. Now that's really deep, and he's talking about even his own people back in the day who made the mistake and the continuation of the mistake. And this is the correct understanding for what he's talking about and the freedom in a sense from everything that any religion has been based on. Not to mention the reasonability comes into it too of the resurrection establishing the atonement because if we think of the atonement like he does as the undoing of error, it was the resurrection that really established that undoing of the error. Right. And the error is that there's such a thing as death if life's eternal. That's also the that's also the correction of that idea that God um, sacrificed His Son. You know this this whole thing. That's what that's what's so radical about the course in terms of right. religion, because it's it's saying that God didn't even know doesn't even know about the world. Like this is our, our projection. There's no sacrifice involved. That that we did that. So and and in the end, the atonement says we didn't do it. Because right. it, uh, with the resurrection, it was proved it never happened. Yep. <laughs> this particularly anti-religious concept happens to enter into many religions. And this is neither by chance nor coincidence. The real Christian would have to pause and ask, how could this be? Is it likely that God himself would be capable of the kind of thinking which his own words have clearly stated is unworthy of man. And that's always the thing that, I mean, one of the things that never made sense, that, you know, here we are in the perfection of reality or heaven, and God kicks his sons out so they could die to learn something. I mean, it makes absolutely no sense. You know, the, the, whole, the whole theory behind that makes no sense so you know it introduces what he's talking about the fear of god and that's at the bottom of every religion the idea that you know we, if we come together and pray and worship god god will be appeased and you know we'll get on god's good side rather than being on his bad side as if there's sides to god you know so <laughs> What's interesting to me too, though, Teddy, it is like, you know, for many of us as a kid, that's what we did question. You could yeah. say we were real Christians in the sense we were asking those questions from when I was a little kid. What the fuck's going on here? You know, and reading in the Bible and with Jesus, this God that creates everything perfectly, yet everything here ends in death. 
And so you were, if there's a God that's wholly loving, why would he do all this stuff? So we were asking those questions. But, But what's interesting to me is even though I was asking those questions, how um, the punishing God idea can still be quite so rigidly held in mind still, you know, the idea of attack can still be, you know, and still be quite, yeah, like the fixation on that, even though the reasonability of the mind is asking, how is it so? And the course comes in and goes, it's not so. That right. seems to be still a time lag between the acceptance of, oh, it's just a stupid mistake. Hence the reason why most churches don't believe it's really from Jesus. And it's an individual program and they like the establishment. They want the establishment to prove that they have something that they can give you and you need it. So you have to come to them and it's 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 mirroring the god that they think is real you got to come to god in supplication because you know god's pissed off that's the exact opposite of what jesus is saying he says you're just afraid to come to god because of your own thinking god is love if god is only love what would you be afraid of you must be afraid of love not understanding what love is and that's what he is saying, that we are afraid of redemption. But And that could be, you know, because we have made ourselves special and we're afraid to lose the yeah. sweetness or whatever now. This has become familiar. What is not natural has become familiar to us. And so it is, this is why we need a course in miracles where it seems to be incrementally letting go of our own fear of our own redemption and salvation. In um in the Urantia book, it talks about um, how Jesus' message was basically um, what he wanted to teach people was we are God's children, God is our loving Father, and, and He is love. That's what that was the message. And there was a a follower called Abner who really wanted to keep that as what the message that was taught. But of course, Paul came along and taught about the crucifixion and all that stuff, and um and it got really mixed up. It's pretty clear in the Bible that's what Jesus was teaching. It's got very mixed up by, you know, by Paul's message of, you know, about the crucifixion and how he died for our sins and all that rubbish. <laughs> it's true. The best defense, as always, is not to attack another's position, but rather to protect the truth. It is not necessary to consider anything acceptable if you have to turn a whole frame of reference around in order to justify it. This procedure is painful in its minor application and genuinely tragic on a mass basis. Persecution is a frequent result justified by the terrible misperception that God himself persecuted his own son on behalf of salvation. The very words are meaningless. It has always been particularly difficult to overcome this because although the error itself is no harder to overcome than any other error, men were unwilling to give it up because of its prominent escape value. In milder form, the parent says, this hurts me more than it hurts you and feels exonerated and beating a child. Can you believe that the father really thinks that way? It is so essential that all such thinking be dispelled that we must be very sure that nothing of this kind remains in your minds. I was not punished because you were bad. That's keeping it simple. <laughs> I was not punished because you were bad. It's so awesome, this, isn't it? Because it's so it's written in such a, a um, conversational way okay. that we can say like it wouldn't it wouldn't say that in the course that it's it's silly that I'd be punished because you were bad, you know. But this is just a approachable way to hear it. This okay. is also, it's also reminding me why the course, especially when we first come to it, can seem a bit heavy 
because it's the course is is about undoing the blocks to the awareness of love right so it's not saying be loving or be joyful or be you know it's like look at the hate and as you look at the hate and you look at the judgment then that will start to fall away and then the love and the joy will reveal itself right but but it can it can seem a bit heavy sometimes because it's like no you've got to look at the darkness and then as soon as you look at the darkness without judgment it goes away but well it gives you it gives you the simplicity of the truth like you know i was not punishment because you were bad now look at everything we've thought in relationship to that and you got to start to laugh um but he but he does give you these very very simple this very simple understanding that you can utilize you know as a way of looking at the convoluted thoughts we have in our mind about all that stuff which i find you know that's the spectacular nature of it you know he takes us through all this convolution that we have in our mind and he gives us a simple phrase to look at that and when you look at it from the simplicity of the phrase you really do have to laugh at you know your own sort of your own sort of misunderstanding and stupidity at believing it you know <laughs> which is good but you're absolutely right peter i mean this is what the value of these notes are because they do put it in such a simple conversational way so it's sort of really accessible for a lot of people and also demonstrates the just the the conversational nature of the relationship we can have with Jesus. He's not sort of some distant, highfalutin, I'm the one that you have come to know as Jesus. You know, and that's what I think the value of the notes is. The value, part of the value of the notes is in the simplicity of the conversation Jesus is having with them and the willingness to talk to them without judgment of them. But like in the simplicity of their own thinking in relationship to, you know, what's true. You know, here's what you think and here's the simplicity of the truth. Now, you know, come on, which makes more sense? Here's a very simple statement. Is your complexity and, and, and you know, the absurd nature of the twists and turns that you use to maintain it? You know, is that anything compared to a simple truth that I was not punished because you were bad? <laughs> I, um, can I just um, say something on my own behalf at the moment? Um, I just feel like I'm in the middle of a major sort of correction in my mind. And one of the things that's just um, come up for me today, and it's been coming up a little bit, is this thing of, uh, well, think it, I noticed it just before, is all these years I've been meditating in the morning and trying to find the connection, trying to find the connection, trying to find what it is I have to do to find the connection, to make the connection happen. And I realize I've been trying to make that connection happen. And something that someone said, maybe Peter, uh, earlier on, I realized, oh, the connection is already there. Look, I don't know how many thousands of times I have to be told this, but I'm... I think I'm starting to hear it and I was the reason <laughs> I said something is because I'm hoping that me saying it will help me hear it um like well, it's, you know this whole thing of I need to do nothing it's actually I need to do I need to stop doing all this stuff I'm doing thinking that it's going to do something and I need <laughs> to just be still a moment and listen so yeah okay that's as far as it I mean, goes right now I mean, that's what i'm saying with this simple statement like it, what he says is i need do nothing yeah i, I mean i need do nothing just be still okay you cannot not be whole and perfect because wholeness and perfection is the nature of the kingdom and there is only the kingdom all else is illusion and does not exist so therefore is not true now we're so our minds are so steeped in levels of illusion that you know it has to wind down to some sort of basic level before we actually undo enough to see 
how simple it is. But when it does, it's like, oh my God, look at that ton of shit I've been believing piled high and deep. And none of it was true. And what the ego does is it tends to say, if this is true, imagine what's, if, you know, if this is how messed up you are, imagine how you messed up you are if you go any deeper. So it's trying to keep you from going to those depths because thinking that's where the fear is. And what Jesus is saying is, no, 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 that's where the love is. The fear is in the unwillingness to let love be total, to let love be all there is, to let your, to make your thoughts mean something. And that, I don't know whether that's what, um, part of it, Alison, but it is for me, it's, it's like, you know, it is the undoing of the error and the error is basically the only block is fear in a sense. And when the fear is gone, it was like someone was saying to me just in a simple form the other day, aren't you afraid of speaking to people? And I said, no, you know, it's like I've got a certain level of fear that's undone. So it's not there anymore. I mean, I would have used to be. So it's the same sort of thing. When the fear's gone, you're in your natural state. You're immediately there. It's just like having a, a cover over the sun. When the cover's dispelled the sun was always there you know it was always shining it was always perfect it was always radiant you know so in that sense we're not changing or doing anything other than undoing the block and bringing the block to light yeah. and that's what the forgiveness is and the more fear that's forgiven or seen through the more false then you know you're much more in touch with your natural state it's happening naturally because you are already in your natural state it's just again like like I, I go I'm standing in the middle the kingdom of heaven but I see it not take away what's blocking me from seeing heaven there I am there everything is the communications there it's all happening already I'm just you know knotted up and holding on to something that's stopping me seeing it and I've got to just take out what, you know, like the Bible says, you know, if your eye offend me, I've got to take out that eye, which I like the sort of analogy of that eye because it's the self-concept. That's the eye I'm seeing through. Take out that eye that all those thoughts are taken and there I am. I suddenly, like I, I now realise what he means when he says that atonement is undoing. I didn't have a clue. And actually, actually I think you brought that up the other day, Teddy. And I thought, oh, that's one of the things I've been thinking is atonement at one minute is, you know, the same thing. And I started thinking about, you started me in a process of thinking about now I'm, I'm just realizing, okay, now it makes sense. It didn't make sense last time you talked about it to me. Um, it didn't make sense to me. Now it does. Okay. I'm starting to see how this works. <laughs> <laughs> and that's all we have to see. When we see how it works, we're willing to work it. Yeah. And Thank when we see that it works to undo, you know, the fear, then we work it. When we think it's working, and, and this is this next sentence, and I think this is going to be the last sentence that I read because it's getting too dark in here anyway. And I think the next section is, is important as well. So he says, I was not punished because you were bad. The holy benign lesson which the atonement teaches is wholly lost if it is tainted with this kind of distortion in any form. So what he's saying is we have forms of this distortion that we haven't recognized as a distortion left yet. And it, it, it could be radical or it could be, you know, it could be very seemingly you know, eh, not such a big deal, but even, but the, but, and that's what the ego likes. The ego loves you to find out these huge things. It hates you to find the little things that you do every day that are actually in the way as well, because eh, that's not a big deal. There, there is no, there is no degree to it. 
they all they all are um, a distortion in our mind and need to be undone. And that's really important too about that littleness because you never know whether that one one that we seem to skip over it's like that can be the cornerstone like the whole lot can be resting on that and we think it's something just oh, it's okay but it's not the, that can be representing the whole cornerstone where the whole lot collapses for us it reminds me of nicole rios you know from one of the non-duality groups saying as soon as we hold an any image of ourselves it distorts our whole vision so it's as soon as we start identifying with any image of ourselves, our whole vision is distorted. So it's like one thought. That's where, you know, these really forgiven minds are so vigilant for the kingdom because one little thought starting to be entertained and believes distorts the whole vision and the wholeness um, becomes a grand division again. And what Jesus is saying is it doesn't matter whether it's a positive distortion or a negative distortion. You know, we, we tend to ignore, we, we just tend to ignore, you know, the good thoughts we have that aren't true um, because they don't feel the same way as, you know, the bad thoughts we have that aren't true. But equally, all of them are equally false. Um, can you give an example of what a good thought is? Because, I mean, like I've sort of, with Peter and I were talking about this recently, because through my experience, it's like a lot of the, say, um, fear is bound up with more negative judgments or, or, or like against stuff. And what my experience is more, as that stuff's cleared out, you're really raised above. So you don't, it really becomes more seamless. And it's almost like the, the positive and negative gets undone with the negative in my experience. So we well, sort of it's possible that that's true. But like, you know, the other day when I read what Regina said, she said, you know, a healthy body isn't any more real than a sick body. So we make, we make health the goal thinking that we've healed our mind. Yeah. Okay. So I would say again, yeah, as all the fear comes up, you're starting to see you're not a body. So it becomes less relevant. True, It does become less relevant. But then when, when, when in a moment in the downtime, you could think, oh, you know, I feel much better. That's, that means I'm not a body. Whether you feel better or not doesn't mean you're not a body. Both or neither one of them means you're a body. You're not a body in any regard whether you feel good or whether you feel bad. But we have these like positive affirmations and a lot of people use the course for positive affirmations. Like he's saying the healing of the body is not really the, the goal of the course. It's the healing of your mind of illusions. And the, one of the major illusions is that you are a body and space time is real. And if I'm good, if I'm a good boy, God will reward me. And if I'm a bad boy, God's going to punish me. Neither one of those are true. Yeah, can I say, lesson 12 covers the good thoughts as well as the bad thoughts. Right. So thanks for everybody hanging out. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I really find it helpful to read these notes with people. That's all I can say. And um, the conversational nature and Jesus just being a friend and elder brother, it's just incredible um, to show us that we're like him and to take him off the pedestal that he's been put on by, you know, religious establishments and their need to set themselves up as well. I've got to also say too, I love that we're reading this together because I think it's it's also that idea of joining. I think, um, you know, we come together and it's almost like we're given more through coming together and more understanding through joining than maybe if we're sitting alone in our own association, you know, just trying to hear what he means by ourselves or what he's saying. So that's, I really appreciate that too. I've been wanting to ask actually, is the um is the urtex the same as the notes? 
No. No, that's why I was wondering why you kept on putting the urtext, Kevin, in the group notifications, because we're not reading from the urtext. We're reading from Helen's notes and Doug Monckton's um, transcription. I'll put that in there, do I? Yeah, you always write um, Teddy's reading from the uh, Helen's notes from the urtext, and we're oh, not okay. actually doing that. They're, these notes aren't from the urtext. So they're included so, in the urtext, but this is Doug Monckton's um, transcription from her shorthand. Thanks, Teddy. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. I agree with you, Annie. It's um, it just increases in efficacy when you're doing it together, when you're reading it together. There's some shared mind going on, so we're getting a shared understanding instead of just our own, whatever we consider to be our own yeah. thing going on. Definitely. We you know, you come together with this, with the in. A single purpose whatever that single purpose is allows the joining to occur and minds joined have a lot more power and understanding than minds in separation because that's what the problem is i mean jesus says over and over you can't do this alone and the application i mean people read this alone and that's it i mean the application has to be with in reference to your brother and the world around you Otherwise, you're not doing what's being asked. You're just reading the book and thinking you know what it says. And there's the sharing of ideas which strengthens them. Yes, definitely. Ideas are strengthened when they're shared. Yes, yeah, so thanks everyone. And thanks for showing up too, Brendan. Because it can be sort of tempting not to show up when you're kind of feeling a bit funky and it's probably... We used to always say at the Miracle Center, that's the time to show up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks everyone. And that thought did come up, yeah. <laughs>